we're here to talk about the challenges of training and supporting this interdisciplinary teams because we are talking about a new model of care and that's going to require us to, to change the way we do things. Now, in my the way I tend to think about this is, is I couch everything in terms of Don Berwick's AAA because really the patient-centered medical home is the operationalization of that. And, and Berwick has, has, has said and written, and I think most of us have accepted, that to transform practice to meet the AAA, we need a practice that's able to deal with population health. We need a practice that's able to improve the experience of care, and I appreciate that, that that's as important uh, a quality metric as any other metric we um, can come up with is how our patients and families experience the care that we're getting. And of course, our, uh, part of the reason we're doing all of this is that our, our, un, our thinking is that if we do those two things well, we will decrease the cost of care, which is what everyone is concerned about and what's driving this transformation that's going on right now. So the triple aim is behind what we're doing. And I think the things that we're going to need to do that is, is an interdisciplinary team. They're essential to transforming primary care practice. I have my little medical home, kind of looks just like Jeff's. And, um, and, and he's already asked these questions. So what we wanted to do with this panel is move on to, OK, how do we actually make this happen? And we're fortunate to have some people who can address the questions of what are the new competencies that people need to learn? What, what's the best way to teach them? And I, I think that's still an open question, um, actually. Is it um, there's a large movement going on within the medical and within health professions education to talk about training in interdisciplinary teams. Does that mean you want a team full of trainees in different professions? Or does that mean that you want your trainees to be working with teams and in that context? And or do you want them to do both? And there's an argument on, on both sides of that. I think that's a really interesting question that we need to uh, need to address. And then the other thing that we have to do, because we're not going to have enough new trainees to run this new healthcare system, is we need to think about how we retrain the existing workforce to work in this new paradigm. Can you actually teach an old dog new tricks is, I think, an open question. We're fortunate to have uh, four panelists to address this from various health professions. We have. I think in order, because I asked them to sit in this order, um, Jean Lang, from the, who's the dean of the School of Nursing at Quinnipiac University. Um, Side note, I was born and raised in Fairfield, Connecticut, and I remember when it wasn't a university. Um, <laughs> so congratulations on that. Marie Smith, a pharmacy uh, professor and assistant dean for practice and public policy partnerships at UConn School of Pharmacy. Um, and I didn't ask Vina how to pronounce her last name, which I meant to do, but it's uh, Vina Chenemseti. Did I get it close? Okay. <laughs> Excellent. The Associate Chief Medical Officer at Community Health Center Incorporated, your largest community health center in Connecticut, and Bernadette Thomas, the uh, Chief Nursing Officer also at, at um, Community Health Center. So I'm not going to say anything else other than think about questions that you want to ask these panels. How we wanted to organize this is we've given them each eight minutes. <laughs> eight. And my job is to... Um, be the stopwatch to move through the discussion, and then we're going to open the panel for your for your thoughts and discussions. Um, as you're listening to this, think about what you can do, because the purpose of this conference, remember, is to develop an action plan for how Connecticut is going to transform its workforce to create uh, a uh, medical homes that are going to be centered on either the patient, the person, or the family. And I'm going to close these. And because you don't have slides, so we'll just leave slides off. Oh, do you have slides? No, I don't know. Okay. No. So, do you mind? Well, hello, everybody. Um, one of the things that um, gives us hope, I think, is that the World Health Organization has done a lot of work in reviewing whether or not it makes a difference. And not surprisingly, it does make a difference. There's a lot of evidence out there to show that how we train people does make a difference in how they practice when they leave us. And so um, we've been looking at what are some of the challenges in doing that. And I think one of the ideas that's already come out today is that it's not just about training the new people, but about training those who've already been in practice. But I would say most of our professions have a very aging faculty. So while I'm not fond of the term old dogs, um, 
I do think that we need to really look at the attitudes of faculty and how they've been trained and how they have worked in their practices because their old ideas and attitudes about other disciplines really need to be put aside so that we can move forward and think about how can we all level the playing field so that we respect each other and so that everyone has an equal voice at the table and that we listen to each other. So with that in mind, uh, I think that at Quinnipiac, we've tried to really look at what are some of the barriers. And if you look in the literature, uh, there's a lot that's written about how hard this is to do. Uh, first of all, there's barriers related to geography. Not every school, uh, every program, every university is situated next to each other. And they may be across town. So being able to physically be in the same room together to plan, to collaborate, to have students working together can be a challenge. There are also issues with not everybody's always on the same page. And so how do you get everybody to buy into the notion that this is important? We've certainly had a lot of help with the Institute of Medicine, with the future of nursing, with a lot of the documents that all the professions have come out with saying that we need to really look at interprofessional collaboration. But uh, I think we still have a long way to go to really achieve that. So some of the things that I think we've been able to do at Quinnipiac, and I certainly do not have all the answers, but I think we're putting structures in place and processes that are really going to help us create what we hope will be a real national model for interprofessional education. First of all, we do have all of us together on one campus. So we have a school of medicine that'll be admitting its first students in fall of 2013. We have a school of nursing uh, who educates nurse practitioners as well as entry level nurses at the baccalaureate level. And we have a school of health sciences. So the School of Health Sciences provides uh, education to occupational therapists, physical therapists, athletic trainers, uh, physician assistants, diagnostic imaging, I could go on. But you get the picture that we're all on the one campus, so we have the, the opportunity to be able to get ourselves together. Next, we have three deans of the three schools who really have a shared vision on this. And so there's a lot of interest and um, opportunity and resources being made available to faculty to be able to collaborate and think about creative new ideas. And one of the things that we did last year, which actually started before I came um, to Quinnipiac, was a committee on interprofessional education. And that committee in one year brought together faculty from all of the different disciplines and they did a lot of collaborative work on visionary planning for how might we really make this Quinnipiac University stand out as being known for excellence in this area. And what they did was create a um, center for um, interprofessional education. And that center does have university funding, and it is bringing together the three schools who are the steering committee, and they do a lot of planning in terms of how faculty will do research projects together, how they will do different types of um, educational things in the classroom. We also are doing some things um, that I think are kind of unique in that we have each other on our committees. So a nursing faculty will go to School of Health Sciences business meeting and talk about what's going on there. We have a School of Medicine person on the School of Nursing Curriculum Committee. The School of Medicine has a School of Nursing faculty on its curriculum committee. We share um, interviewing processes for admissions to our Doctor of Nursing Practice Program with the School of Medicine, as does nursing participate in its admissions committees. So I think the idea is trying to get us to start working together so that we understand each other, where we're coming from, and so that collaboration ha happens naturally. So what are some of the things that we're doing as far as the students are concerned? And here's where I think we're at a beginning stage. Um, first of all, there's, as you pointed out, a lot of curricular reform has been going on with the new essentials that we're accredited by. So that's one thing. Um, we've in integrated all of the th concepts that you've talked about up here as, that are essential, including the informatics and so forth. 
Uh, we also will have um, our buildings are situated such that they're shared spaces. So we will have 16 standardized patient rooms that have a common electronic health record throughout all, all of the different disciplines so that we'll all be going in and seeing the standardized patients and being able to document on the health record what that discipline's perspective is and being able to talk about those shared cases. There are some shared um, courses going on that are case-based, where different disciplines are presenting cases from different perspectives, and there are mixed um, groups of students in there and mixed faculty who discuss those cases. In nursing, a couple of our faculty got together with occupational therapy and went into the um, home care area and looked at visiting patients' homes with respect to safety and capacity of the residents. And so they got to learn kind of what does OT do and what does nursing do. And those, I think, are important things because we think we know what each other does. But when we work together, we really see what each other does. I think I'm probably close to um, running out of time. So I have two minutes? Whoa. Two minutes. I have two minutes. OK, I'm doing all right then. Um, <laughs> We have a lot of simulation um, options. We have right now five st um, simulation rooms, and we have two more um, that'll be in our new building um, that'll open in March. And there's a lot of opportunity there that is just starting to happen. Nursing was kind of the front runner in really using a lot of simulation in its classrooms, but now we're starting to see a lot more of the physical and occupational therapy and the PA students coming in and wanting to be involved with our, our um, um, students and so I'm seeing that that's going to be an area that's going to grow a lot more they're not all set up by the way as hospitals we do have some spaces that are modified apartments so that you know students can go into what looks like a home experience together and work with a patient or family the last thing I wanted to mention really is about partnerships and I think that schools can do a lot uh, to improve how they work together, but it really is so important what the students see when they go out there and get their real practice experience. And so being able to partner and find those places that are willing to try and work with us and create those unique experiences. We've got a couple of things that I'm pretty excited about, and one of them um, is at Middlesex Hospital who approached us about a dedicated education unit for nursing. And so we've got that up and running, but my hope is that we're going to expand that so that we might have physical therapy, occupational therapy students, PA students going in and onto that unit and seeing the same patients that our students are seeing in nursing and have some shared um, conferences and, and planning around the patients that they see. So I think I will leave it at that for now and um, let the next speaker come. Okay. So clearly everyone took my eight minute admonition seriously. Um, let's move on to our, our next speaker. We'll address what I think is one of the um, more exciting things to happen in patient center medical home, which is the integration of pharmacy into the team, Marie Smith. Thank you. Good morning, and I think what I'll do first is just to start by making sure that everyone knows what the basic training looks like for pharmacists today, because I'm finding in conversations both in other healthcare professional audiences as well as public audiences, um, the pop, people just don't know. So um, the entry level degree for pharmacists today to be able to sit for a license uh, board exam is the doctor of pharmacy degree. So it's a doctor of pharmacy degree. It's anywhere between the equivalent of six or seven years of college, depending on which school you attend. Um, most of the schools in Connecticut, um, that degree only started being offered when it became a mandatory across the country. So that's a little over 12 years ago. However, the degree's been around, the training's been around probably since the 1960s. The expanded curriculum to the doctorate level really enhanced a lot of the coursework and mostly the clinical experience work that pharmacists 
um, have today beyond just the former bachelor's degree was really maybe more product focused or dispensing focused. And today all of us who are educating pharmacists are really uh, have a greater emphasis on the patient care and experiential component. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So the, the competencies, I think, is an interesting uh, topic to talk about. However, I'm, I'm going to go back and sneak back a little bit to just increase knowledge and awareness first. Because in order for um, any health professional to be collaborative, coordinate care, work in that team-based environment, I think one of the things we sometimes forget is we forget that we don't always know enough about the training of those other healthcare professionals or other healthcare staff. So uh, one of the things we tr we're trying more to do in our experiential learning is to look for patient care um, delivery sites that do offer a variety of models and um, looking for patient-centered medical homes or person-centered care programs uh, as they exist and as they come about, then that becomes of more interest to us, maybe comes higher up on the priority list for us to look at for training opportunities. The ones that we do have, I'll mention a few of them. Um, we try very much, you know, um, I should say we are located in, um, in stores, on the stores campus, so that is not a, a health science campus. Um, schools there would include, and the health professions would include allied health, physical therapy, nursing, and pharmacy. Our colleagues that are in the audience who are from Yukon School of Medicine and Dentistry are in Farmington. So there's always that challenge of, uh, you know, 40 miles or 45 miles or whatever it is. Um, but we, we try to, to work through that with some of our interdisciplinary training. So um, I'll talk about one program that does have an academic base, which is interdisciplinary. However, most of our work is really going to occur in an interdisciplinary um, experiential um, method. We have a, as a public university, we have a strong commitment to public engagement and service learning. So we actually kind of double dip on our interdisciplinary training and our service learning. So um, student, PharmD students would be out working with medical students, dental students, nursing students, uh, physical therapists, social work students um, in settings that are things like um, soup kitchens, um, going to senior centers, um, migrant farm workers. Um, so delivering health care to some of these maybe underserved or less served or maybe even more interesting and complex patient populations is a, certainly a site for us to do interdisciplinary training in our, in our program. Um, the second would be to look at what we're doing in terms of primary care clinical experiences. So the, la the entire last year of the curriculum is all experiential learning, so it is not based in stores. People are all over the state and country, actually. But in terms of um, the types of sites we like to use, in Connecticut we have great sites. Our two colleagues from Community Health Center will talk about their program, and I won't tell you a lot about the pharmacist's involvement there because you're going to hear how that person's integrated in our students. We also place faculty, our model is to place faculty full time as much as possible in those sites so that they become part of the team. They are not there Mondays and Wednesdays from, you know, 8 to noon for training purposes. They are part of the team. So that's an interesting model that, that we use. Um, so federally qualified health centers, uh, many of which, as you heard this morning, are already on the path or are, have received um, level three NCQA designation as a medical home, are sites that we use. Uh, we also um, use outpatient clinics, so places like uh, Bergdorf, Brownstone, um, those kinds of, of centers who, um, again, are at um, probably level one. Okay, level one. So we're, you know, we're we're really trying to look at those models of people who are already on that path. Um, another um, opportunity for us would be um, even some out-of-state experiences like Indian Health Service um, or other kind of governmental types of public health service um, sites that we use out of state for training in a in a more interdisciplinary primary care setting. The one program that we have that is extremely interdisciplinary and has been very well recognized and won awards um, 
nationally is a interdisciplinary program across the entire Yukon campus and it's called the Urban Service Track and Bruce Gould is in the back of the room is a big part of that um, along with many of the other faculty that are in um, medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, social work, have I forgotten anyone else? PA, PAs from Quinnipiac are also involved in that program. So that's another, another program that um, is an academic program, so it's not just simply experiential learning. These are, uh, we call them urban service track scholars. They, they actually um, apply and compete to get into the program. And they are trained not just in an experiential year, but during the year, during the academic year, when they're in their training. Uh, of coursework even. They are working kind of almost like, it's, uh, you almost think of it as like a minor in some ways because it's that intense. Um, so that's an interesting program that is available to, for our school, it's about 20 to 25 uh, students each year out of a class of 100 that get into that program. And then we also have, um, we support residency programs, so postgraduate, so after far receiving a PharmD, we support some residency programs for um, pharmacists in training sites that are ambulatory care, primary care um, centers as well. Okay, so I'll wrap up and just say, um, you know, one of the, the interesting things is we train, I think, in interdisciplinary. Then the challenge for us is what do you do now that people are graduated, have a license, and then what happens? And that's where it kind of crumbles, okay? Um, but when things crumble or don't work, my motto is always follow the money. The money issue is a problem for us because pharmacists are still compensated and the payment model is compensated on product dispensing. It's not, comp we're not compensated on these new models of care. We're not seen and recognized as a provider under Medicare. I think we're one of maybe the few or the only. We were just talking about this yesterday. Um, so we, we are not in that stream. So you can imagine that workplace managers and administrators are not too excited about, even though you're training people here, the workplace opportunities are down here. So there's got to be some rebalancing. We hope that not only in care delivery, but in payment reform, some of those things will come, come into, into play. And I would just say that in, for somebody like us who um, are in academia, eight minutes is just so short. So if you, <laughs> if you really want to know more, actually um, some colleagues, some interdisciplinary colleagues, myself and a couple of folks who are in phys uh, physicians, Tom Bodenheimer and David Bates and um, our colleague Paul Cleary at Yale School of Public Health wrote an article that I'll send over to Jill and you can post it called, it's in Health Affairs May 2010 issue, the primary care issue, called Why Pharmacists Belong in the Medical Home. So I guess that's the rest of the story. Thank you. Again, that, that was perfect. And I do think that, that, that you've really pointed out the, the um, struggle that we have in trying to put together the team that's going to be uh, needed for this patient-centered medical home and really recognizing that we are have to pay it differently or it's not going to happen. Um, that's real clear. Well, let's move out of academe for a bit into the real world. I, and I gather this is going to be a, uh, a, a, you're going to be talking together is what I heard. So I'm going to let you guys come up here and we need to find your slides, which I'm sure are queued up on here. In the spirit of interprofessional collaboration. Right. <laughs> well, good morning. So we have uh, the honor of speaking about kind of the frontline work and what we do at the Community Health Center. So just um, a quick bit about ourselves. We are um, the largest interdisciplinary level three um, patient center medical home primary care center in Connecticut. We actually started in 1972 as just a dental site. And we've grown from there to over 200 care delivery sites throughout the state all with integrated dental. And we have over 140,000 active patients um, with over 400,000 visits. 90% of our patients are 200% below federal poverty level, and about a quarter of them are um, uninsured. Um, all our sites have one record and integrates all the disciplines. Great, thank you. 
So this is just a, a quick picture about our, um, our buildings. And when we were building this kind of world-class primary um, healthcare center and patient center medical home, we recognized that the physical plan is vital to our patient's experience. And most of our sites have undergone, um, undergone renovation for this. And we focus not only on the physical plan and the technology behind it, but also to facilitate the integrated care that's the cornerstone of a patient center medical home. So we're gonna kind of get into the nitty gritty of what we did when we trained our staff and our community on what it was to be a patient center medical home. So what we did is we essentially created a culture and started this fairly large campaign. And the campaign was called Welcome Home. And um, we started with an kind of a, and it was together, it was an external campaign for our community, for our patients, um, public relations, and there was also an internal campaign for our own workforce. Um, so the external campaign was what had many, many levels. We started with um, postcards. Let me just quickly show. So this was our welcome home campaign. We started with postcards that we sent to almost every physician in the, in the state. And it's that bottom, post, that bottom postcard there, and it kind of just describes that we have become the patient center medical home, what it was, and kind of just reintroduced ourselves to the medical community. We also made brochures for our patients that we handed out at Access to Care. We handed out at the, at the front reception, um, and it kind of defined the patient settled medical home and what it meant to them. We included patient center medical home now into all our patient ed material in our patient ed packets um, that go out to our new patients. And again, it defines what a patient centered medical home is and what it means to them when they come see us. Why are they seeing multiple people of the care team in one visit? They might just say, well, I just came to see the doctor. So, that packet now explains that. Um, and also we had um, bus ads, billboard ads, um, inside the bus ads, at, all, at almost every site, at almost every city that we had the site. So part of this campaign also went over to our internal staff when we were training, when we were training our workforce. Um, so we began, what, what, what this began as is a kind of a fairly large, happy, almost celebration-like uh, email that went out to all of CHC employees saying, congratulations, we have become a level three patient-centered medical home. Now, what does that mean? And that email did have some definition of the patient-centered medical home, but that wasn't enough. We really needed to kind of train our staff, make them feel that they were part of this. So we already got awarded level three, so does that mean we're already doing everything right and no further training needed? So no, so we went and we um, did what we call kind of internally the tour de state. And we had our all our clinical chiefs visit every single site and train them on what we were doing as a patient center medical home. And it started with um, kind of creating a easy acronym for all our staff to remember and go by. So we created this poster, patient, and that poster went to every single site along with all the clinical chiefs. So that means the chief medical officer, the chief dental officer, the chief behavioral health officer, um, as well as our VP of quality um, went to every single site. And it took a long time and it took many, many days. And um, we started with this poster and that was kind of the, just, just for fun, we showed kind of, that was the schedule we had. This was kind of the, um, the what do we call it, the toolkit? <laughs> the toolkit that we had, every site had. We had candy, we had dry erase boards. It was kind of planned out to the detail of what every site needed. And um, we started with this, and we had those posters up for all our staff. And we just reframed it for this acronym for them to kind of um, to understand it more easy. And then part of the training was this. It was a large poster that just was like this, a dry erase board, and we essentially had this up and we presented this in a very large, integrated, interactive, team-based training. And so what we did is, uh, um, so what we had, let me just find the, I hope it's the next one. Okay, so here's, here's the picture. Um, the actual picture has many people standing around it, but essentially it was, a, it was in this interactive training and we began with each team at each site kind of rating in their own words how they felt that their exact role contributed to these measures of the patient center medical home. So first we, trained, first we trained on the measures, and then we had them rate themselves on the measures. And you can see along the top, we, it was a truly, um, truly integrated team. So we would just go down the list, and so we would say for A, access. And then we would go around the room and say, okay, every single role we would like to hear from you, come on up here. And so we would say, okay, IT, is anybody here from IT? How do you provide access to your patients? And then you can see, 
under MA's DA, dental assistants, come on up here, how do you? And we went down and did this across the board. They rated themselves and in doing that, they thought, well, maybe we don't do this so well or maybe we do this well. And it was really kind of a free flow of ideas and we came up with how they felt they did and we also came up with a lot of ideas of how we can be better. So I'm, I'm going to tell you how we continue this process at the Community Health Center. So um, we, you, you all know if, if you've converted to an electronic health record that it's a very complex process. It adds a lot of complexity to patient care. And to actually utilize that health record um, for, to meet the measures of a patient-centered medical home or meaningful use, you have to train and retrain your staff. So every year, what the Community Health Center does is our, we have a committee called the Super Users, ECW, we use ECW as our health record, and we go out site by site, and we train every member of staff, again, each year, how to use the health record to, to actually document the care that we're giving that meets the patient center medical home standards. So this is just one of the slides. The, the, slide, the slide set is um, over 100 slides, actually. It goes through every single measure, but also the specific measures for patient center medical home. And like many um, healthcare institutions, we also have ongoing learning activities for all of our staff. Um, it's, they're required for medical staff, but all, all staff are welcome to attend, and there are interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary presentations. Um, and we, we do have, um, I'm going to show you a couple of presentations which are de dedicated to the patient-centered medical home, but we also, for our, for our sort of disciplinary focused um, training, for example, um, on kidney disease or hypertension or nutrition services, we always ask our speakers to integrate patient-centered medical home standards and goals into their presentations to continue this ongoing training. So um, this, you know, this particular Grand Rounds was actually on improving screening and disease control at the Community Health Center, and it was presented by our Chief Quality Officer, Chief Medical Officer, Chief Quality Nurse, and also um, our Senior Nurse Manager, very interdisciplinary presentation. We also, when we launched our patient portal, which you all know is one of the standards for patient center medical home, our presentation was given by our ECW super user, Erica Sparks, and our chief medical officer, as well as one of our family physicians. And um, we do, we, we pride ourselves in the integration of pharmacy services. We don't know what we'd do without them. Um, but uh, one of the presentation was uh, by Stephanie Nigro, Marissa Salvo from uh, UConn School of Medicine, and or School of Pharmacy rather, and they um, are great supporters of the patient center medical home and, and help us deliver excellent care to our patients. And then most recently, um, we launched a e-consults pro program also with UConn, and, and this uh, Grand Rounds was delivered by our chief medical officer. And this is our effort to actually deliver excellent cardi cardiology services to the uninsured, underinsured, and patients who live in communities who have um, scarce access to cardiology services. And then, you know, to kind of give a nod to how we do um, interdisciplinary training and education, I want to talk to you about our residency programs. So we, we have two residency programs in operation at the Community Health Center right now, one for nurse pra family nurse practitioners and one for psychologists. And we train all of our residents to the PCMH model, and we, we pride ourselves in this. So we have interprofessional collaboration and education. Training happens in teams. Um, but it also, th these residents also work in teams. So one of the efforts that we've actually begun this year is the, these residency programs have their own didactics, their own education components, and for the first time this year, we're actually going to be training the residents together. Um, and this is how we're going to move forward with this, I, this uh, interprofessional collaboration and education. All of our residents are also full participants. We, from the day they get in, into um, our health centers, we ask them to join committees and quality improvement projects. The uh, quality improvement um, model that we use at the Community Health Center is not, not just the PDSA, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but also clinical microsystems. So uh, we, we have all members of our staff participate in clinical microsystems, including members from finance, human resources, IT, providers, medical assistants, nurses, pharmacists, nutritionists, the works. So I would just add to that that we also have, um, so in all of our students that are there, um, whether it be med students, farm students, um, MA students, nurse students, um, any training that's going on at the center, they are a part of. So they kind of 
benefit from the culture of the patient-centered medical home that we've been developing. So we went over how we did that initial training of all our present employees, and we're certainly can't really, we don't have the resources to do a tour to state every year and um, go to every single site. So we recognize that every year we have many, many new employees that join the center. So what do we do to train them in the patient center medical home when we can't really do that whole patient um, poster for them? So what we've done is we have incorporated um, the PCMH training throughout the onboarding of all the staff that join the health center. So all staff during the general HR um, orientation get take a look at that patient poster and do a quick set, kind of a, a quickie on what the what they think the roles are um, and it's included in that, uh, that the kind of general HR orientation that all staff go to along with the um, EHR training that Bernadette mentioned for all staff still it trains them annually on um, the patient centered medical home measures in the electronic health record in addition, the medical staff of the new providers or the new, um, the, the new, new staff will also um, ha have a focused meeting with myself and the chief medical officer, which is, can be up to anywhere between three to six hours long with us. Um, and they get further training called the kind of the medical orientation to the, to the community health centers, during which a, a good portion of it is the patient center medical home measures, how we got there, what it means on the front lines, um, the sharing of roles and responsibilities at the front line, the, um, the, I guess, the integrated care and how the team works as an equal and not as, um, uh, not in um, any sort of supervisory order. And um, that happens in addition to the general orientation training that happens when they first get here. In addition, Bernadette, um, as the chief nursing officer, is presently developing a similar orientation for all our support staff, which will also incorporate um, these patient center medical home measures for the um, training of all the dental assistants. Um, you don't do dental, right? Just med medical, medical assistants and, and, and RNs. Yeah. So you, you can see that we've um, spent a lot of uh, resources and time and training um, our existing employees and our new employees, but we also uh, are committed to the ongoing training through quality improvement efforts and also utilizing our electronic health records. So just wanted to talk briefly about some ways that we do that. So we use clinical dashboards um, in our practice um, to, um, to actually do focused huddles, which I have a picture here. There's actually a clinical pharmacist, a medical assistant, a family physician, and uh, a nurse working together, and they have focused, focused huddles using these dashboards. This particular huddle is a hypertension huddle to improve care to our patients. And this is actually um, a training, we actually have training videos on this, so we train people to, to actually perform these huddles. We also do daily huddles, and this is a, a training video and a picture of one of these huddles with a nurse, a family physician, and a medical assistant. Um, and we use the clinical decision system um, that's embedded within ECW to help focus our huddles on cancer screening, diabetes care. And we also have a weekly missed opportunities report um, that comes out um, once a week, although we strive to be 100% each and every day, we're not often 100%. So every week we get this report and it shows us actually where we didn't perform as well. So it can help us improve not just our individual processes, but sometimes they're actually technical pro um, difficulties that people just don't actually know how to record their work properly in the electronic health record to actually meet the measure. So it's not that the work isn't being done, it's just that it's not being recorded properly. And, and I think the bigger question somebody had asked um, earlier is, how do we know it works? How do we how do we know it even makes a difference? So you know we can and we do um, do clinical measures and follow these clinical measures through our missed opportunities. We do the panel management through our dashboards. We huddle. We do a lot of work every day. But how do we know that actually led to improved clinical care? Which I think is uh, the easier measurable um, data. But how do we know it led to a better patient experience that they liked coming to this now patient-centered medical home? So we actually employ um, a fairly large company that does patient surveys for us, and they call um, multiple patients of every provider every day, and they make up to nine attempts to call that provider, and they um, speak multiple languages, and they score based on many, many questions asked, and they convert it into a score. It's a, it's a complicated scoring system, and um, we follow that score. We follow that score, and we follow it as an aggregate to see how we did last quarter versus la the next quarter versus since we started this change in flow, did that make a difference? Um, and that's our patient satisfaction survey. That serves as further training for our employees because that, that feedback is given back to the medical director 
who then feeds it back to the provider and the provider team um, to see what kind of improvements need to be made in customer service, whatever that customer service is in, in your role. Furthermore, to highlight the importance of patient, uh, patients and medical home to our providers, we now include um, the PCMH measures as part of their annual performance appraisal, and it's now considered a job expectation that these measures are met. Um, and they are a job expectation at this point. Um, so you'll see that our annual, our um, performance appraisal is many, many, many pages. And this is one section of the page that we added, and it's the job specific standards for the patient-centered medical home principles. And there is these lists that we kind of define what, what can be measured and what are some of these principles. And um, they know that at any, at, during any annual performance appraisal, that we can pick any of these measures and um, see if they're doing them, and it'll be uh, it'll be it'll be scored as part of their um, appraisal. So the future. So, you know, I, I think that, you know, we've done a lot. I don't know if we've done everything, but we you know have done a lot to um, train our workforce, continue to provide training for our workforce. Um, but I think there's still a lot that we can still do, and I think that one of the things that we hope to develop is um, an integrated training simulation um, to build kind of teams that share roles and responsibilities, and they can have that training from the start as, or, as an integrated team during orientation that they can then, when they hit the workforce um, on the front line, that they can continue to practice in, with those principles throughout their career. Thank you. Did I make it? Awesome. <laughs> I, I had the opportunity to review those slides, I think, last night, and I was impressed then. I'm even more impressed now that I've heard the words that went along with them. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, so the panel is now open for questions. I just wanted to start with a couple of observations. Um, uh, the first is that uh, clearly this, it cha this training is something that needs to be, I, I wrote down here, baked into the structure of our practice reform. And, and I was impressed that all of our speakers talked about how they were both changing what they did and then making structural changes that reflect that change in the nursing school um, and how you integrate with the other schools, the pharmacy school moving out in, and finding partners to work with, and certainly in the, in the description of what we just heard at, at CHC. Um, th in order to do that, you need places that are transforming. And what I heard is that it's good to have places that have transformed Formed, but it's also good to have places that's, that are transforming. Don't wait till you're done before you start thinking about training. You have to bake it into the structure as you go along. Um, there, there were two issues that struck me out of all of this around um, sort of the, the, the filthy lucre, the money that makes all of this run. Um, and, and the first is thinking hard about how we're going to compensate for this care. Um, we have some payment, you know, one, our, our innovation in Rhode Island has been uh, a payment, a different model of payment that Jeff spoke of. Um, in Massachusetts is in the middle of massive payment reform. You're gonna hear from my colleague, Judy Steinberg, a little bit later. Probably she'll mention some of that. It's, kind of baked into what we're doing in Massachusetts. Um, but it, we have to pay differently and we have to think about how to pay to support the teams um, that are going on. Um, the model right now and the accountability model tends to go to the license. It goes to the practice, to the practitioner. And I think somebody was speaking before about the, the legal liability for care, but it also gets to how we're compensating for care. And we need to think about how to make those things match. And finally, <clears throat> An issue that we've been struggling with in Rhode Island is how to get our patients to know that they're part of a patient-centered medical home. And I think um, you've given us lots and lots of examples of how to do that. That was an impressive tour de force in, in uh, marketing this both to your staff and to the, to the patients. So those are just, just some observations. They align really, really well. All of what you're talking about aligns really, really well with what's going on at a national level. The Affordable Care Act, um, actually asked a lot of the federal agencies responsible for workforce to think about how to develop a new workforce. Unfortunately, they didn't fund developing a new workforce very well in the ACA. Um, that was supposed to be for the next round of health reform, so we'll have to see what happens um, in a couple of weeks, and that'll tell us where we're going with that. Um, the floor is open for discussion. I'm sure there's lots of questions. Let's start over here. And I think those mics are live, so you can use them to respond. 
Yeah, you just mentioned the word accountability, and that has an attractiveness because in person-centered medical home, I'm from Community Health Network in Connecticut. We're the ASO for the state of Connecticut. And with integration, and I was interested in the CHC model um, as well, with the uh, patient and team integration, and capitalizing on accountability, not only of us doing our work well within the centers, but patients, that being reflected in the person or the outcome, per se. Um, I'm interested in capturing uh, a dynamic of uh, how does that person get involved in the core planning within your team, not only in regard to the patient surveys, but the actual, you know, um, physical uh, interaction on your, on your care teams, um, or, you know, are, are they on committees? Are, are you hearing from families and, and people within that uh, scope of planning, per se, to be a part of this whole phenomenon? Sure, I'll try to answer that. So um, we, in, in a couple of our sites, Meriden and New Britain, we've, we've actually launched shared medical appointments um, to try to address patient integration into the care. So they, these shared medical appointments are, have a pharmacist, a nutritionist, a diabetes educator, a provider, a nurse, and then a group of patients. So this is one, one way we're trying to incorporate patients into the, the whole care process. But I would say, you know, larger as an organization, we are also committed to building communities. And this is another way that we get uh, patients to participate in their own care. So whether it's supporting local farmers markets or we have a Recess Rocks program, which in, intends to bring um, exercise, integrated exercise programs into schools. Or in New Britain, one of our pediatricians did a, a, a tremendous photo voices project to actually train high school students. Um, to actually take pictures of their communities and lobby politicians to make um, structural interventions in the New Britain community to make it a safe, healthy place. So that's how we have are integrating patients into the process right now at the Community Health Center. We've also um, started patients as peers, peer mentors through our um, through our. Um, Right now we're doing it in diabetes, but plan to expand. So um, right now we've um, identified well diabetic patients who've done well that are in the community and speak the language of the community, and they can hold group visits or become mentors to other patients who might be struggling with you know similar barriers. Uh, just to, are, are you guys also FQHC? We are. Not. So yes. the other piece of that is as an FQHC, 51 percent or more of their governing board is made up of board. of patients. Consumers who use the clinical services. Okay, next question, one right there. there. One thing oh, from the sure. educational perspective, because I, I think it's important that students also hear about the care they're providing to patients. And so one of the things that the, um, the role models for the standardized patients will be trained to do is give feedback to each and every student that they encounter in terms of how they interacted with that person and how they made them feel. Yeah, and I, I, I'd echo that. In our uh, medical curriculum, we have a pretty strong emphasis on bringing the patient voice in to talk to, talk to students as they're learning about what the experience of care is like. I, I think mm -hmm. that's critical to training. Okay, there was a really strong hand right over here. I'm going to pick that one. Um, over at <coughs> CHC, I saw um, your point on missed opportunity reports. I just wondered if you could explain that a little bit further, how you obtain that information um, and how you're utilizing it. So IT, I think somebody said it earlier, is essential. So we have a, a, a large IT mm. department that's created queries. And what they, looked at, what they look at is, uh, on a weekly basis, is um, number of mammograms that were due but not ordered, uh, number of colonoscopies or FOBTs that were due or not ordered, number of A1Cs that were due or not ordered, that, that sort of thing. And um, it's generated, at, right now, um, it's generated by a provider. So all of these measures are linked to providers. I, that's something that will change. I mean, as we're seeing this differentiation, or you have to change your workflow at um, the health center, that many of these measures will now be assigned to nurses and medical assistants because those are the people with the primary responsibility for actually ordering it in the medical record. So we, we rely on our IT department to generate those reports. And they're largely automated. And they're all located on, we have an intranet at the community health center. So any person can access them at any time by going to the quality improvement um, page of the intranet to get to these reports. Let's see, over here and then you. Uh, 
for Dr. Smith, can you give us a couple of ideas for near-term payment reform for pharmacy? Um, thank you, Mark, for that question. <laughs> 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 well, let me just say this. I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that there is no payment for um, more what we call cognitive <laughs> services or something like that. Um, but most of it today is being done um, on grants. So as many people know here, um, and I've worked with some of you, um, we do a lot of grants to do proof of concept, demonstration <coughs> grants. We've worked very closely with Connecticut Medicaid to do you know, some medication management um, grants that have been pretty widely accepted and received a national award and those sort of things. So th they, there's grant funding for it. Um, there are what I'd call pockets of excellence across the country where you might have a, what I'd call an enlightened progressive payer, commercial payer, who decides that they are going to try something or bring out a new benefit package. You know, So um, the one that comes to mind is uh, Care First in Maryland is doing some very interesting things where they are paying. Um, and I'm, on a public side, the uh, state of Minnesota actually passed legislation to um, pay for pharmacists to provide uh, to certain eligible groups of patients with complex medication needs um, for, for these types of services, medication management, all within the construct of a very much of a team-based care. So there are models, but they are very few and far between, and I think until we see large commercial and public payers really stepping up and kind of going the, it's almost the last mile when you think about it. It's just that last piece, because people are ready to do it. And, and I think there's a very, one of the questions I get is, is there a receptivity from physicians? That's usually the question. And, and I, I would say, ask the physicians in this audience if they've had that experience, but most of them find it to be extremely collaborative and can increase the efficiency of what their workflow is like as well. But it's got to be done in a very collaborative way. If, if, if I can just interject, one of the things we found in Rhode Island is um, our, our transfer, the, the, the secret sauce for us is the nurse care managers, which initially we require, were, were paid for separately by the plans as part of being part of the patient-centered medical home. It's now so widely accepted that that's necessary for the team that it's rolled into their PMPM. So the practices are expected or required to hire the nurse care manager if they want to get the enhanced PP, PMPM for doing that work. Um, I would might submit that one other approach would be if one of your focuses is on metrics that are going to be susceptible to having a pharmacist on the team, that's another approach you can use is to make it part of the team-based payment rather than, rather than, and this is my plea, creating another widget. Our, pr our primary problem in medicine is that we pay for things on a fee-for-service basis by service provided, not by outcome of service. And um, so I'm, I'm always hesitant when new folks want to get paid, whether it's behavioral health or anybody else who's trying to get into the, the payment pot, that we not create another set of widgets so we're paying more for services without focusing on outcomes. Anyway, next, let's see, there was back there. I have a question in particular for the um, um, community health centers. In terms of our rural um, patients, our rural residents in the state, and their, the integration or collaboration that you have in terms of transportation for appointments, and particularly return appointments and follow-up appointments for our rural citizens who don't have as much access. I can address, I, I can address um, what we have done in Middlesex County. Um, you know, we are, I, I, I know, the, I can imagine the challenges that health centers like Generations have. I think they're more rural than we are, um, absolutely. But um, when we think of one of, one of our counties, Middlesex, where um, our, we've got two health centers in Middlesex County, one in Middletown and one in Clinton, but our catchment area goes from West Haven all the way up to Deep River, you know, all the way up the county. And you, most of our, uh, we have one of the largest uninsured populations in Middlesex County. So you're also talking about the working poor who don't necessarily have good access to transit. What we did in that community is um, <coughs> we made a, a collaboration with um, Middlesex Transit um, and they actually put a bus stop right in front of our health center in the, in the Clinton, the town of Clinton, which really has improved access for the shoreline community. So I think when you're talking about rural um, settings, that's probably the one 
you know, where we're trying to get in people from the shoreline communities and up in the county um, down into the Clinton office is how we've managed that situation. Otherwise, it's um, logistic care if the patient's eligible uh, and grant-funded bus tokens or other transportation vouchers. And, and one of the things that we are considering is um, kind of going to where the patients are. So rather than having one large site in one place, such as Waterbury, which tends to be a very um, pedestrian community, um, we are probably in those type of communities considering opening up mini satellites kind of throughout the neighborhoods so it's easier for, um, for them to walk to us. Um, we are also in many of the shelters. Um, so in, on our shelters, WIA, wherever you are. So we try to come to wherever you are through the shelters. Um, working on the satellite office, and we try to make our um, main facilities um, as bus accessible as possible. Yeah. I, th I think the, the key lesson out of that that I'm hearing is if there are any payers in the audience is when you're creating the medical home teams, one size doesn't fit all, and you really need to adapt the team to the community in which you're trying to work. Anybody over on this side? I've been picking over here. Uh, thank you all. That was a very interesting panel. I have two questions for the Community Health Center. Uh, it seems that you started your presentation in the middle of the process, that you began with the uh, NCQA recognition, uh, but it must have been a much longer story than that. So could you share with us how long it took for you to get to where you are today, number one? And then secondly, uh, tell us a little bit more about the um, the uh, changes that you made to, uh, structural changes that you made to a workflow to support the uh, multidisciplinary team. So I think I can start with question two. <laughs> 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 and that's, um, so we have something called pods. And so what we did is we structurally changed what the pod was, where I think when we started, the pod was a provider, two MAs, and a nurse. And that was the kind of the medical team that happened. Um, with kind of our renovations and, and the building of uh, new buildings, we have made the pods larger and have essentially integrated in other disciplines into that pod. So now a pod at any one time would be um, two physicians, two nurses, uh, two MAs, one nurse, behavioral health, and when um, pharmacy can join us, pharmacy will kind of share in all the pods. Any one, one site might have four to five pods. Um, and um, during our meetings, we would have um, nutrition join us. Um, so we physically changed it so we could physically integrate other disciplines with us. And we changed the huddle from being provider driven where um, maybe just maybe even a year ago, the provider would look to see that all the screening had been done to now in an MA driven huddle. Um, so our medical assistants does that entire medical huddle. And then the following day we'll sit with the, um, the provider, the nurse, and the behavioralist um, and go over the patients for the day. Uh, well, just to add to what um, Vina said, and then I'll go to the first question. Um, well, well, just so you know, in the pods, it might be a nurse practitioner and, and physician providers. Um, so um, the, the nurses have also taken over ownership of the dashboard, so where the medical assistant has taken ownership of the huddle, which is the cancer um, screenings, diabetes care, the, the actual dashboards, which are diabetes care, more, speci more um, components of diabetes care and hypertension care, chronic pain, the nurses have taken over the management of those components. So they're, they're driving those quality improvement issues at, at the patient panel level. With respect to um, how long does it take, um, you know, I can speak to the, what we're trying to, Waterbury is our, one of our newest sites, so it's not included in, in our designation right now. So we're onboarding uh, Waterbury right now, and it's a process that we've been working on for months and months. And what we do is we meet as a team, and in the team is uh, the chief medical officer and myself, our chief quality nurse, our data person. Um, might be missing a couple people, but we go through measure by measure and we pick out how we're going to actually, which measures, how, how are we gonna fulfill these measures, what are we gonna look at, how are we gonna capture the data, and then we actually assign out the who's the point person, um, what's the date of the deliverable, and then, so it's, uh, I mean, we've been working on this um, since August, uh, right now for the Waterbury site, so uh, you know, I, I'm thinking that the, I can't really tell you how long this particular process is going to be, and unfortunately, um, the chief medical officer isn't here today who could really attest to how long it took to get the other 
11 health centers <laughs> um, on board, but um, I'm imagining that it was probably a year-long process to go through the, you know, all of the measures and actually compile all the data that was needed. So th uh, there, are, there are lots of questions, but I, I'm reminded we started five minutes late and we're five minutes into the promised bathroom break um, <laughs> that we have to do. So the panelists, I'm sure, will love to talk to you on the break and be back here at quarter of? So we'll give you 15 minutes. Be back here at 10 of. Thank you very much, and thanks to our panel.